Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Last week in the tafsir of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the seer of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we looked at the failed assassination of the Quraysh of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which acted or prompted the hijrah, the migration of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So last week we looked at the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sahibuhu and his companions Abu Bakr as siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And from the lessons we learned last week, first and foremost was husn tartib, the good organization, planning, and execution of the plan of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when it came to the planning of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for that hijrah, we'd mentioned in previous classes that the hijrah was preceded by what? And Isra wa Mi'raj, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it took him from Masjid al-Haram to where? Masjid al-Aqsa. And all the way to the seventh heavens. But in order to teach us and for us to follow the example of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in strategy, planning and execution of plans, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was made to make the hijrah with this specific and detailed planning. So part of the planning and the strategy of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam began with the time he went to the house of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And what did we mention about this time? What was special about the time he went to the house of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu? Those who used to follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and spy upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they knew the programs of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So therefore they know the two times he will go to the house of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu that Aisha radiallahu anha said he will never fail to come to the house of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq except during these two times. But on the day of Hijrah, what time did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam go to the house of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu? Did he go under the cover of dark? No, what time did he go? At the time of Dhuhr, when the sun or just before Dhuhr was at its peak. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chose this time to go against the time he normally goes. And secondly, because at that time, the sun is what? At its peak. Everyone is in their house. Nobody was out. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he chose the right time. Secondly, when it came to the strategy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that if people are spying on you, if there's surveillance upon you, what do you need to do? Counter surveillance. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered the house of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he had his own counsel surveillance measure. What's the first thing he said to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu? Akhrij man indak. Tell everybody that's here to leave. Everybody to leave. So the first thing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered everyone to leave. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said, Huma ibn Tayyah. These are my two daughters. Asma and Aisha radiallahu anha. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's not just, okay, this is my daughters in this stuff. What did he do after that? He continued to look around. And this is his companion, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He said, who are those two? Then he said to him, that's my mother and that's my father. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa then began to speak. So we could see also the level of secrecy that nobody knew the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was leaving except for the family of who? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And who else? Ali ibn Abi Talib. And why did Ali need to know? We know Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu went with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why did Ali need to know? Because sometimes when something is a secret, confidential, there's something that's called, called need to know basis. Because there was nobody in Mecca that had any valuable goods that they want to place in a security deposit or anybody they could trust from the mushrikeen except the leave of who? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he left Ali in charge of giving back to the people what they entrusted him with. So Ali radiallahu anhu, he needed to know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was leaving. So secrecy. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ista'inu ala qadha hawa'ijikum bil kitman. Assist yourself in fulfilling your needs, your ambitions with secrecy. Meaning not every single thing which you do, every single person needs to know about it. Ista'inu. Because physically, some may harm you. Spiritually, due to al-ayn, the, what they call the evil eye, but it's not really the evil eye, we say al no, the eye. Because al ain it could be an evil eye or it could be a good eye. A mother who loves her child could afflict her own child with the eye. Not out of malice. And that's why the hasid, the one who is envious, is more evil or is worse than the one who has what? Ain. 
Because one as I just looked at it, he didn't say, Allahumma barik, which is the dua from the sunnah. Oh, mashallah, some scholars say. And he afflicts someone with the ayn. Ista'inu ala qadaha wa ijukum bil kitma. So the Prophet here was traveling. He didn't tell anybody. But normally when you're traveling, normally when you're traveling, need to know bases. You could tell somebody, I'm traveling. Your workplace, for example, companions, do you need anything? But generally speaking, it's not something to be announced. That your affairs, while you're in the planning stage, keep it to yourself, only those that need to know. It doesn't mean, for example, you have a walima or aqiqa, wa amma bin ni'mati rabbika fahaddith. The favors of your Lord for hadith convey it to the people. And one of the flavors of your Lord is what? Marriage and walima. It doesn't mean, you know what, I want to keep it secret. You know, I don't want ayn. I'm going to hold my walima in a phone box. It doesn't mean this. The walima, you're supposed to announce it. Everyone come and get barakah, aqiqa. You announce it. Because the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi with one more child has grown. However, though, in most things, in the planning stage, what you're doing, what you're planning, only those that need to know, keep it a secret. So we see the secrecy of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. After this, we said part of the strategy and the planning was they left the house of Bakr Siddiq through what door? Through the back door, not through the front door. And Abu Bakr Siddiq, we also learn from this, his sacrifice. That the Prophet came to him at a time he never normally comes. And he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has permitted me to go, has ordered me for the hijrah. And Abu Bakr, what's the first thing he asked the Prophet? A suhbah, am I going to be your companion? He said, Naam. And Abu Bakr he started to cry out of happiness. Most of us now, and this shows the sacrifice, he was on standby 24 hours. Prior to the hijrah, thinking it may be him, he already bought the two camels, feeding them, waiting. He already hired a guy to take them on the way. But you're planning, okay, I'm going to get a day's notice, two days notice, three days notice. They say the military on 24 hours standby, but I've never seen a standby like this. If I come to the house of one of you today, I said, Akhi, we're going to Al Khor right now. I said, Akhi, man, you need to give me time. That's just Al Khor. But now I'm saying we're making the hijrah a dangerous path. We're going to be pursued. You're going to leave your family behind, your wife, your children. We're leaving right now. Because they didn't stay around, they left immediately. Abu Bakr radiallahu an was ready. And it's not, okay, look, I have to leave this for my wife. I have to do this. I have to go shopping. Nah, none of that. And that's why the father, Abu Bakr radiallahu an, what was his name? Huh? Abu Quhafa. At that time, he was blind. He couldn't even see. Old man. It came to Asma, radiallahu anha, and he asked her, what has your father left for you? And because he was blind, Asma, radiallahu anha, she gathered some rocks and stones and placed it in a cloth. She said, Taraka lana khayran, is left good for us. But we know grandparents and grandmothers and grandfathers, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them. There's a brother who's telling me the story of his grandmother, that although she was blind, she would send him to the shop and ask him for the change, uh, ask him for the change, and she was still trying. Even though she was blind, she knew brought back the correct change. They're very insistent and persistent. My own mother, her mother, my grandmother, she was illiterate, she couldn't read. But every time my mom came home with the school results, she insisted on looking at them, even though she couldn't read. And I remember this very well. She'd go out, my mom told me, in the middle of the streets and call people. Anyone with suit and tie, you know how to read, don't you? Read this result. My mom was used to be embarrassed, subhanAllah. You think I'm going to lie to you? And they'll read the results to her. The only thing she used to get low marks in was Yoruba. And then she'll get angry. This is your language. How can you get low marks in this language? This is your own language. English, A, 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 everything else. So these are old people ask. Abu Quhaf would insist. What did he leave? She said, Taraka khayran. But he wasn't satisfied. She would take him to that cloth. It would fill the rocks. And he said, yes, he's left good for you. And with only rocks, he left nothing. He left Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an. And this shows his sacrifice in terms of his wealth, in terms of his own self, his own life for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. From the beginning of the da'wah, if you remember the class of Seerah, remember Abu Bakr what happened to him at the Kaaba? He was beaten till he passed out completely. When they were going into the cave on the Hijrah, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, he wanted to go in first to make sure everything is okay. You know these presidents, these abir, these shuyukh, they have people called, what do they call them again? Bodyguards or bullet, bullet catchers. But that's all rubbish. Nobody's catching a bullet for nobody, seriously. In most cases, they're not, forget the bodyguard, forget nobody's diving in the way of no bullets. 
But Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, if anybody is to be a bodyguard, a bullet catcher was him, that he blocked the holes which were in that cave, knowing there could be a snake and a scorpion. And not only did he get bitten, he held it in and he didn't want to cry or make any noise not to disturb the Prophet while he was sleeping. The Prophet وسلم, only woke up, why? Because of the tears that dropped from the eyes of Bakr dropped on the face of the Prophet Even those bullet catchers, they catch a bullet, they're screaming. But he, nothing, radiallahu ta'ala an. His family, how did he sacrifice his family in the cause of Allah and his message sallallahu alayhi wasallam? His daughter Asma bint Abi Bakr, what was her nickname? That, Nidaqain, the one that has the two belts. She was the one that would bring the food to them. His own son, imagine he, get, he gets caught doing what he was doing. Which was, what was he doing? In the daytime, you hear what the Quraysh is saying. Spy and you go and report to, to the Prophet Sallallahu and Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhumah. So he sacrificed himself, his wealth, and his family for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So we looked at the sacrifice Abu Bakr radiallahu an. So it's such that they left Mecca. Upon leaving Mecca, Hadith in a Tirmidhi, may Sahiba Shaykh al Albani, Rahimallahu Azza wa Jal, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Wallahi, it was said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam turned around and he looked at the Kaaba, he looked at Mecca. And the eyes of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is swelled with tears. He said, Wallahi, innaki la khayru ardillahi, wa innaki la ahabbu ardullah ila Allahi, lawla ukhrijtu minki ma kharajtu. He said, by Allah, he looked at Mecca with tears in his eye, saying, you are the most beloved land of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or the best land of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the most beloved earth or land to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Were it not for I was expelled from you, I will never, ever, ever have left you. Why? The most beloved. And Mecca is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, beloved to Prophet sallam, but other than being beloved, to Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is where they what? Originally from. And that's why even with the hospitality, the generosity of people of Medina, Bilal radiallahu anhu, she used to sit there and make poetries and remember where? Mecca. Because that's where they're from. Not only due to the sanctity, the holiness, the sacredness of Mecca, that's where they're from. That he said, if your people did not expel me, I would never, ever, ever, ever have left. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him that which is better. And the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala and whom? Due to what? As we mentioned, the good planning. Because we said the purpose of the seerah is to serve for us as a what? And it's an example to follow. So the first thing was the planning. So we look at the plan of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in our time today, 2019, we also make the hijrah, the migration. Look at the planning of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The planning did not start on the day of the hijrah. When did the planning start? From the very beginning, when he was in Suq al ukad or when he was doing Muslim al Hajj, calling them. How did the planning begin from there? The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam knew specifically what he was looking for. So when you're planning for Hijrah, you have to know what you, as an individual, or you as a group, you're looking for. And what was he looking for? Because of different tribes, what was he looking for? Protection, people that could fight and also do what? where they're geographically placed, that they could not be attacked from any sides. That was important for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you're making hijrah, your need is different to my need. Some people have children with disabilities, and certain countries may not be able to cater for those disabilities. Be it autism, be it ADHD, be it uh, what the Down syndrome. Some people have physical illnesses and ailments. Some people have educational needs. We're not saying they should override the deen, but go to a place you could fulfill these things along with your deen. Some people, in terms of security, they're more secure in certain places. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the plan began from there. When he found the Ansar, they had this. So the plan began from there. You want to make hijrah? Be practical, pragmatic. Many people have left. They've gone back to the West and they'll never leave again. They wish they never even left in the first place. Not because the intention was not said, but along with the intention, you have to practically plan and strategize. So the Prophet strategized. And then after that happened, what? Bay'a al-Aqaba al-Ula. How did the Prophet plan for the Hijrah after the first Bay'a, the first pledge of Aqaba? He started to lay the groundwork by sending the first ambassador of Islam, Mus'ab ibn Umair. 
to prepare the groundwork. That if anyone is to come after you, everything is set. I know some brothers sometimes, in their eagerness, they want to leave to go to a place, yalla, the whole family, let's go. No, you go first, set the groundwork. Or if you're going as a jama'ah, send one of you first to go and see how it is there. And let him know how it is. Because sometimes people come to these places, they're shocked by needs and assumptions we have. Education, it could be health, it could be anything. But it's too late. And now you can't go back, you're just trapped. You're just trapped. Many people are trapped. You know, cost of living, for example. Education, for example, but now you're trapped. You can't even go back. You're giving up everything. The family is here. It's just no nonsensical to go back right now. So he said, Musa ibn Umayyad, when he was settled and they established, happened what? Bay'a al Aqaba athaniya. And in that bay'a, they promised to fight to the drop of their last blood and give the process of what? Protection. It's after that now. He said to the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, go. So you want to make hijrah? You want to go to a place? No visa, no stay, because we're living in strange times. Most of these places, your, your existence or staying here is dependent upon a what? Iqama. Your iqama is dependent upon a what? Upon work. So you have to be realistic. You're here in 50, 60, you think you're going to be here forever? Some people are, generation from generations. But they have, you have to know what you're going to have to do to be in most of these countries. Very unfortunately, very sadly, that's the situation. So when there was established that they'll give them security, they'll give them peace, the Prophet said, allow them to go. But most importantly, more than all, the strategy was what? A dua. That's the most important thing. You could strategize, you could plan, you could execute. So when you're watching or reading these books about uh, uh, life skills or management or administration, they miss out a very, very important aspect, and that's the spiritual aspect. Anything with no spirituality is absolutely void and rubbish and nonsense. It's not going to work. The most important thing is what? A dua. Like the brother said now, dua. You have to make dua. Invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy and make you successful. This is very important. I think there's an organization uh, that Allah told me about that gives lectures on these things and it attaches a spiritual side to it about administration and planning and so on and so forth. It's very important, the spiritual side of it. Very, very important. So dua. So upon leaving Mecca, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to make a dua. In surah to where? Surah al-Isra. And surah al-Isra came before what? The hijrah. This ayah in surah al-Isra, ayah number 80. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to say, Rabbi adkhilni Madhala Sidqin wa Akhrijni Mahraja Sidqin Wajali Miladunka Sultanan Nasira. Oh my Lord, make for me a sound entrance upon the journey. Initiation of the journey, conclusion of the journey, beginning and end and the middle of the journey. And make for me a sound exit. And the end of the dua, very important. Very important dua for anybody making hijrah. And make for me from you an authority, nasira, who is helpful. When you come to this part of the world, forget anywhere in the world, they talk about vitamin W, vitamin wasita, vitamin W. But that vitamin W that we all know, that's how things run it. You could talk, you could have the best qualifications, you could go for hours and months and apply. I could solve, some people solve your problem over a carrot in a majlis. That's vitamin W. Or even before you put that finjan, or the pour from the finjan, the coffee cup to your mouth, and you shake it again for another coffee, your problems are solved. That's how it works here. However though, due to that custom, some of us seem to put that forth before everything else. The first thing is dua. That the Prophet said, I make for me from you, Sultanan Nasira, a helpful authority. Because for da'wah, you could not do anything except you have some people of position on your side. But that people of position, who do you ask for that first? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he's the one that gave them the authority. And he's the one that controls the hearts. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul malik al -mulk. Say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, belongs all the dominion. Tanzi'ul mulk mimman tasha. He strips the kingdom from whatever. Tu'ti mulk man tasha. He gives to whoever he wills. Kingdom, leadership. Wa tanzi'ul mulk mimman tasha. 
and he takes it from wherever it was. So that person you put your trust in, you could be president today, you could be in prison tomorrow. You could be the, the head of a department today, sacked tomorrow. So you put your trust first and foremost in Allah Azza wa to make for you a helpful authority that will assist you. And then you seek the means to find those authority. But the most important thing in this is dua, to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a lesson for us, that when we see people making hijrah, that we follow this example. It's a lesson for us how the Prophet left Makkah. That he left with tears in his eyes. That you are the most beloved earth to Allah. And the person making this dua is the what? Oh, the, the best land of Allah. The best of the creation of Allah جل, was forced to leave the best earth of Allah. He said you're the most beloved land to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The most beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was forced to leave where? the most beloved place of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we see people nowadays being forced from their land, and these are good lands, Muslim lands, or even non-Muslim lands, but good places, this happened to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa When we see people being forced, either due to religious persecution or the fitna our children face in those countries for their deen and their morality and ethics, the Prophet of Makkah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're forced to leave where we love. You have to know that, that the best of people, even where you love naturally, it could be from the West, that's where you're born. You know, there's a natural love we have. You cannot help that love. And that's Allah ta'ala says to the Prophet ahbabta. You cannot guide those whom you love. There's a natural love we have. For where we're from, where we grew up, we may be forced to leave it. Yes, and it doesn't mean physically forced. You know, certain things may be imposed upon you that you're forced to leave it. That to strategize like this. And in some cases, the Prophet ﷺ left in a hurry as he left, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That may happen to us and we see it happen to other people. What did you do? Dua. You have to make a dua and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for you. Very, very important. So as such that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left Mecca with these strategies and this dua. Very important dua. Even for those people that work. That when you come, not only to these lands, most places you work, the corporate environment is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. We do not believe in that rubbish as Muslims. We do not believe in that rubbish. Dog-eat-dog. That dog. I pull him down, I go up. You know your risk. Your risk is written in the heavens. It's not written on those wage slips. It's written 50,000 years before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the creation. It's been written by Allah azza wa jal. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Fattakullah. Therefore, fear Allah wa ajmil fi talab. When it comes to seeking provision, take it easy. It's written. But in those corporate environments, people will try to suck up, kiss up, assassinate people's character just to climb to the top. Make this dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you Sultan and Nasir, a person of authority. That's what? That's helpful to you. And you find this in some workplaces that subhanallah, that the person, maybe not that qualified, maybe not, and the other person's heart, the manager, whatever, it just leans towards him, just like that. You understand? Just like that. Because of sincerity, it just leans towards that particular person. Because of dua and putting his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he left Mecca and he went to Ghar, where? A thaw. Ghar where? Ghar al-Hira, a thaw. Jazakallah khair. I'm trying to confuse the command. Ghar al thawr And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He stayed in Ghar al thawr For how many nights did he say? Thalath al-ayyad Barakallahu fiqh For three nights Upon the third night Who came to meet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Aywa Abdullah ibn Urayqit al-Layfi Abdullah ibn Urayqit al-Layfi Who was the guide And he was a mushrik And they already given him before that what? The two camels and he came at that appointed time to Ghar at Thawr after three nights to meet Prophet Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu he refused to get on any of the camels so the Prophet chose the best one for him then he rode the other one and they made their way and they headed how? south even though they were going where? north because the Mushrikeen suspected they'd be going to Medina so they went south and then from south, they started to head where? North.